Today, we are here with Professor Lazaro Padilha. He is also a professor here at the Physics Institute. He did his undergrad and his grad school here at Unicamp. And then he went to uh, Creole at Central Florida for two years a postdoc. And then he got a job actually at, at um, Los Alamos National Laboratory and stayed there like for two, three and a half years. And now he's back to Brazil and doing some interesting um, uh, experiments on uh, femtosecond and actually ultra fast spectroscopy. And uh, you guys will hear from here today and two classes tomorrow. So it's your turn. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tiago. Can, is this working? I was never good with this kind of thing. So let me, all right. Can you hear me now? I think you can, right? All right. So yeah, it's always good to be like in front of a good crowd like that. People from all around the world, right? Who came from the farthest here? Like, is there anyone from China, Acre? <laughs> no? All right. So, so let's go, people. All right. Uh, they asked me to start giving, to talk about ultra-fast spectroscopy. Uh, basically, I guess because I'm part of the ultra-fast spectroscopy team here at Unicam. And uh, sometimes in life, things go too fast, right? Like our vacation. So we want to try to measure that. And uh, always when I talk about fast stuff, it reminds me about the cartoon, the coyote. Remember the coyote looking for the, the road runner? But when they go, it goes quite fast. And then you go like, all right, how can I catch it? So that's basically what we do, all right? And uh, the reason why we do that is because everything that uh, is actually of interest, not everything, but a lot of things that are of interest, they're fast, all right? If you look in terms of what happens in atoms, molecules, it's always something really fast. Because you imagine, they are pretty tiny. If you're moving inside, you're probably the time uh, that these things are going to happen are going to be tiny also. Uh, and also, there's another thing, is that if you have an electron in a higher state, it wants to come back down, right? It doesn't want to stay there. And uh, if it doesn't come back down for something really fast, it's going to come down by emitting light. And uh, I don't see anybody here emitting light, right? So it means that we're doing something faster than emitting light. If you don't, you're going to emit light. So we have the fluorescence lifetime, which is on the order of like nano uh, or microseconds. And then if we have something that's faster than that, our lifetime involved in the problem is going to be faster because you can just think about a rate equation like that. So we can think about, again, biological uh, phenomena. They're, they're fast. If you think about, uh, for example, semiconductor processes, they're fast. They wanted them to be fast. Imagine like if you, you're developing like a, a new generation telecom system, that's quite slow. Who wants that? I don't. I guess you don't also. So we want fast stuff sometimes. And if you go, another reason for you to get into ultra fast spectroscopy business is that can take you from the lab to Stockholm. You get a free ticket to go there. You get a Nobel Prize. This guy here, Zweil from Caltech, he got a Nobel Prize. Guess what? In chemistry, not in physics. <laughs> so if you want to get a Nobel Prize in physics, change field. It's not going to be this one. So, but then we talk about ultrafast, and it's always good to say what's ultrafast. I was the other day in a talk given by this guy who's a paleontologist. And he told me that uh, he studies very short, very fast events of uh, disappearance of dinosaurs. And that was something about a million years. I was like, holy grail. <laughs> like, that's ultra short for him. For me, that's not. Like, if you think about age of universe, we got it right here. One minute is right here. You guys know log scale, I guess. So you see the distance? That's what the distance of a 10 femtosecond light pulse is from one minute. So if you look from the perspective of a 10 femtosecond light, light pulse, one minute takes as long to pass as for us takes the age of the uni universe. So femtosecond is pretty much quite fast. And if you think about your camera flash, I saw some picture, people taking pictures there. That takes like microseconds. That's an eternity compared to femtosecond. All right? Even the computer clock is pretty slow. All right? 
And uh, when you do it to a fast spectroscopy, we are basically interested in this part of the, the time scale right here. All right? Mostly, in my case, from 10 to minus 15 to 10 to minus 9. OK? And uh, there is a bunch of stuff that happens there. Molecular vibration, electron dephasing, impact ionization, electron thermalization, all this thing. All right? And with ultrafast spectroscopy, we can look into basically all those guys here. All right. There you go. Now I look nicer. All right. So now I think I will start talking to you about how we do that. I don't know if you guys know how ultrafast laser works. I know that some people here know because they just told me that they made one. So I, someone of you know, but most doesn't. So how we do that? Basically, if we're going to use electronics, electronics has a limitation. If you go back in time in the 60s, you can get like very fast electronics compared to optics. But uh, fast enough, the optics went much faster than electronics. And in fact, if you go here early, actually late 80s, there was the fastest laser pulse ever created, six femtosecond. And I have highlighted this name here. He used to be my boss, and now he's my colleague in the group. So <laughs> now I'm his boss. <laughs> so life changed. Anyway, I, I hope he never hear this. <laughs> so anyway, so he was one of the guys who created the first six femtosecond laser pulse. And nowadays, we can get down to 100 attoseconds. That's like 10 times faster than this. All right? That's the limit today, if I'm not wrong. And uh, when we talk about ultrafast spectroscopy, at least where I am interested, it goes up somewhere between 10 and 100 femtosecond pulse width. All right? And how this pulse is generated? How we can generate pulse that short? So if you guys studied quantum mechanics, you guys know Heisenberg the uncertainty pro, uh, theory. And you know that if you have, on the time domain, a very long pulse, you in, the, in the frequency domain, you have a very sharp spectra. Now, if you want to have a very short pulse in the time domain, you better have a very long, very broad spectra in the spectral domain. All right? So if someone comes to you and say, I'm going to sell, sell to you a ultra short, ultra short laser with one wavelength, trust me, it's a, they are lying. They're not going to do that. It's impossible. So to have a ultra short laser, you have to have a broad uh, bandwidth. OK? And uh, in order to achieve that back like 30 years ago, people used to do that with uh, dye lasers. So if you take Rodamin, DCM, or other, uh, DCM? Oh, that's surprising. Uh, some other dyes, you could use them to make lasers and ultra-short lasers because the emission band is quite broad. And in fact, you don't want to work with this kind of laser because of this, not because of him, but because of this. Look, you see? We have this very, very ugly looking way of uh, having our laser medium, which was like some pipes that would actually put like a jet of dye that would come down, they would have a reservoir, the, 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 the dye would come down, then you would pump it up, it go like this, all right? Because you would have like the, the continuous jet of, uh, of rhodamine. And uh, the guys who do ultrafast spectroscopy by longer than I, I, than I do, they know that rhodamine is not nice to work with, and people say it gives you cancer, so you probably don't want that. So that, you see, it would take like pretty much the whole optical table, all right? So, Times comes by, and then people start to make ultra-fast laser solid state. And I think the one that actually came out to be the best would be TISAF. If you go to ultra-fast group today to work, and they don't have a TISAF laser, that's, they are not, they're not ultra-fast group. Because I, like, I don't know any ultra-fast group that do not own a ultra, uh, TISAF laser. And nobody, unless they have a very specific program, nobody uses dye laser anymore for femtosecond uh, systems. And uh, that whole table comes down to like this little box right here, which would be like the SAF oscillator, OK? And uh, like I say, ultra-fast laser is like a bunch of lasers all together. And what does that mean? It means like we have a bunch of colors all together. But someone would say, oh, but the light bulb has a bunch of colors all together. Why is not a femtosecond laser? That could be a natosecond laser, if you think. 
all right? But the idea is that they not only have to be a bunch of wavelengths together, but they have to be all in phase. So you have to, you have to lock all the modes. Once you lock all the modes, eventually they're going to all sum up. And when they all sum up in time, they're going to have a pulse. If you have something that's totally random, they're not going to sum up ever. So you're going to have this noise. All right? And how does that work, actually, in a laser? Uh, I'm going to go very brief onto this. I think you guys may have already learned because I heard that you guys have already two ultra-fast uh, spectroscopy or ultra-fast phenomena courses in the morning. So I, I bet by the name of the people who are teaching, they know much better than I do. So you probably you guys learn much more than I can teach. So, but generally, we can think about the cavity. And those are the, the frequencies that you can oscillate in that cavity, all right? And where L is the, is the length of the cavity, N is an integer. And if you think about like a TICEF laser that emits at around, well, that's the emission band of the TICEF laser. For a two meter cavity, you could have the omega one at five ten to the eight rad per second. Omega two, 10 times 10 to the eight rad per second. And then if you go to the omega seven, uh, what's that? 795,772 it's going to be 4, 10 to the 14 rads per second, OK? And if you take the 3 here, it's going to be a little bit more. 4 is going to be a little bit more, and, and so on and so forth. So if you look, you're going to have all these frequencies that can oscillate inside of that cavity. But then you have to overlap this with this. Once you do that, those are the frequencies that you can oscillate, OK? So this is the frequency that you can use for your laser. So you don't have like infinite numbers of uh, frequency. You get, you're, of course, limited by the light that your active media is going to emit. And uh, more than that, you have the optics and everything that's going to limit what you, can, what you can do. But uh, in general, what you can think is that you have a pulse train like this, that you have the gain media right there, and then you put them all together. That's the band that you have for your laser. And then if you go do some math, the electric field would be done by this, all right? The intensity of the n component times the exponential of the frequency of that component plus the phase. Now, if the phase, they are all the same, you can sum this up. And trust me, you're going to get some equation like this. And you can work the math a little bit more and look at the intensity. That's what we basically look most of the time. It comes like this at the point that you can fit this guy. You have a pulse in time, right, as a sink. This pulse in time gives you, you can get a lifetime from this, which is 1 over tau pulse, which is n omega c over 2 pi, OK? And uh, what's more interesting is that 1 over tau pulse is equal to n over tau circulation, I call, which is the time for the, the, the photon comes out from this mirror, bouncing that mirror comes back to this mirror, OK? It's the time for it to circulate inside of the cavity. So, if you do this, this is a simulation uh, with uh, summing a bunch of cosines. This is, if you do five modes, you get this, and then you get some oscillations right here, another pulse. If you do 50 modes, you're going to get this, some small oscillations, flat oscillations, a pulse, and so on and so forth. If you do like infinity, you get a delta, uh, uh, like a delta, a Dirac function. And then if you look at the resonator round trip time. This is this tau c here, which is 2L over c. So who is familiar with TICEF oscillator? People see that this laser has like about 80 or 76 megahertz repetition rate, right? Anyone ever worked with one of those? Yeah, they have 80 me megahertz. Why do they have 80 megahertz rep rate? Because they have about 2 meters cavity length. If you do the math. 2 times 2 divided by 3, actually here would be 13.3, but eh, about that, all right? So this is gives you the rep rate. And the time width is going to give you by the number of modes that you can oscillate inside, OK? Uh, and uh, I don't know how much you guys learned about uh, mode locking. So I'm just going to go to the specific case for TICEF, and then maybe we can discuss further. Uh, some other times. But here, I, I think Sid gave a, a good lecture yesterday about nonlinear optics. And I know he talked about uh, nonlinear refractive index because I was at the door paying attention to that. So you guys learned about this. And you can have self-focusing, all right? 
And that's a good way to do mode locking because you only amplify the very strong part of the pulse. So it comes back here. Imagine that you have something like this. Oscillates, oscillates, very weak. So here you have high intensity, here you don't. So how cool would it be if you can, inside of the cavity, only amplify this part that has high intensity and get rid of the rest? So you would have a good uh, ratio between the peak and this zero here, okay? So to do that, what you can do is using like a material with a large N2, like the Pi Saf has large N2. So you come with a low power beam, it, you focus down, it goes like this. If you have high power, what's gonna happen is that it's gonna go self-focusing. So the high po power part of the beam is gonna go to the, to the medium and then focus down if you have a pinhole, only that part is gonna go through. So you won't amplify the pulse part. So you get rid of the continuous part. So then you get mode lock, okay? So let's see where we go, okay. But let's go back here, just a little bit. Again, that we're talking about 80 megahertz. If we take an oscillator, we're gonna get 80 megahertz rep rate, typically. We're gonna get 10 nanojoule per pulse. So if, you, if I want to do ultra-fast spectroscopy, really ultra-fast, talking like hundreds, femtosecond, few picoseconds, that's awesome, that's great. My signal to noise is gonna be beautiful. However, sometimes we're using materials that we wanna look at that ultra-fast part of it, but it lives for a longer time, like 20 nanoseconds, or even microseconds sometimes. But then, this 80 megahertz has every pulse after 12 nanoseconds. If they have every pulse after 12 nanoseconds, what happens is that before the materials relax down, the second pulse hits it already. So you start having cumulative effects that you don't want, all right? And more than that, if you wanna use nonlinear optics process, you have only 10 nanojoules. The only thing you can actually, with this high rep rate and 10 nanojoules, you're very prone to create uh, thermal nonlinear optics rather than electronic. So most, most of the times we're, we're, we wanna look into very fast nonlinear optical process, which, which are electronics. So we don't want this guy. So if you don't want this guy, we want this guy. We want to take the oscillator and throw it into an amplifier. And uh, I will give you just an idea how the amplifier works because it's pretty cool actually. So you come with the input. So I take that 80 megahertz, all right? I come with it. I pick one of that guy. I, I take only one pulse. I throw away all the, all the rest. This pulse comes in, goes, comes back hits the tie sap. But before it hits the tie sap, I have a Q-switched, very strong green laser that pumps this and creates a population inversion, okay? So, as the pulse comes here, it finds the material extremely excited. With the material extremely excited, you can have it stimulate the emission. So you come here, go, amplify, amplify back, comes back, goes, comes back, comes back, amplifies, it does this like many times. But there is a Pockel cell here. For, for those one of you that don't know what the Pockel cell does, it basically it flips the polarization like a quarter wave plate. So it goes quarter, comes back quarter. We have a thin film polarizer here. So if it comes this polarization, it goes through. If it comes this polarization, it comes out. So it basically, it oscillates here and until I want so basically what I do is after a few passes and I kept monitoring the, the amplitude of this guy after amplifying, it goes like this. But eventually, my pump laser is not there anymore because the pulse, the skill switch, it takes like a, a cup, I think hundreds of nanoseconds, okay? After a while, it dies out. There's no more laser there. And when there's no more laser there, you start only losing the cavity and then nothing happens. You come out nothing, the same way you enter. However, if I switch my focal cell right here, I come up a very strong <laughs> pulse, a lot amplified. So typically, this guy operates in kilohertz rep rate. So one kilohertz up to 10 kilohertz, okay? So this is given to you by the rep rate of this guy over here. And uh, we can amplify this up to a few millijoules per pulse, which is a lot of energy. If you think about it, 
when you think about one millijoule per pulse at 80 femtosecond and one kilohertz rep rate, if you work out the math, gives you a peak power of 12.5 gigawatts. Anyone have an idea what puts out 12.5 gigawatts of power? You guys know this place here? That's the max they have ever did, 27 gigawatts. In my lab, I do 12.5 gigawatts. If I take my laser and Sid's laser, all right, we have a night typhoon working for us. <laughs> now, I'm going to miss two, two gigawatts. Then we're almost there. However, my typhoon only works for, for 80 femtoseconds. <laughs> I don't know what can I do with that. However, we are physicists. And we're in the lab, we feel like a, a, sup, uh, like a, a superhero, <laughs> don't we? We really feel like a superhero in the lab, don't we? We feel like we know something that no one else does. Nobody cares, but we do. <laughs> However, with a laser like this, I feel more like, more like this superhero. <laughs> uh -huh. Not because I get blonde, no. Not strong also, but look at this. This is so strong that I made a, a, a video for you that uh, I can, oh, Jesus, wait. I can create thunder in the lab. Let's see if I, all right, lightning, should I say. That's why I call myself Thor. So you guys see here, there's nothing. There's a little bit of a red light in here. And if you pay attention here, what I'm doing, just increasing, just shortening the pulse. So I'm playing with the laser, shortening the pulse. You see this? There's nothing. It's just like air being ionized by laser. I'm focusing on the laser here and you start seeing other colors. I keep shortening and start ionizing, creating white light in air. Someone went, to, some of you went to my lab last week and I did this magic. So if you start seeing this is gonna get so strong that's gonna light up the whole thing here, eventually. Not that much, but. All right, you see? You can even see like the controllers here now that was all dark. <laughs> so what I mean by that is that we can create lightning in the lab. So it's pretty cool. This is a tiny lightning, but yeah, it's a lightning. So, and I only can do that because uh, the, the laser is so close together, like the photons, I mean, are so close together in time that there is like a huge chance that I can have two photons interacting with the matter at the same time. So in other words, I can easily access the nonlinear optical regime. Okay, you guys have some nonlinear optics course uh, the last two days, and really, with such a laser, we can do nonlinear optics in air. So this is nonlinear optics. Okay, that's what we're doing, uh, and uh, it's good that because uh, sometimes we want to use nonlinear optics. Okay, how we? The question is why we want to use nonlinear optics, and I only have one hour to talk here, right? So if I, whenever it's like five minutes to go. Please stop me because tomorrow I have two more hours. So if I don't finish what I have to say today, I continue from that point on tomorrow. Okay? I don't want to like uh, disturb the schedule. All right. So when we talk about ultrafast laser or ultrafast spectroscopy, when you talk about spectroscopy, it means that I don't want to simply use my TICEF laser that emits at around 800 nanometer and do all the measurements I can. Because that's only 800 nanometer. That's not spectroscopy. Spectros spectroscopy means that I will look what happened in terms of the wavelength also. All right? And to do that, I can do both two ways, basically. One is generate a wide light continuum and use that as my probe. And another way that's used quite a lot is using nonlinear optics to generate optical parametric amplification. OK? Basically, what we do is you guys learn about some frequency generation yesterday? We're doing some frequency generation backwards, all right? Instead of coming with two pulses and come up with one that's a sum of the frequency, I come with one pulse, which has, let's say, 1.5 electron volt, and I come out with a pulse that has 0 0.5 and another one that has one, or 0 0.6 and 0 0.9, or 0 0.7 and 0 0.8, and so on and so forth. So I can do that. And to do that, I only have to conserve momentum and energy as physics, right? And to do that is actually quite simple. It's so simple that I have two undergrad students developing one of those in my lab. So we come with the laser, 800 nanometer. We split this first, just a tiny bit here, like 
comes here, generate a sapphire crystal, for example. And this is going to generate a white light continuum. OK? Like, I generate white light continuum in the air. So I can generate white light continuum in a crystal. That's, that's like very easy for us. So we generate the white light continuum. <coughs> and then we take the other pulse, 19% approximately. We come here with the continuum, hit a nonlinear crystal. We amplify one color. Then we take another part of the beam, the, the, the leftover 80%, make it come to the same crystal again with the amplified beam, and then we amplify it again. Doing that, we can amplify the color we want, OK? Basically, uh, I made like a cartoon, like horrible. So we have a delay stage, OK? And you have the crystal. So if I move, put my delay stage such that this while I continue travels, at the same time as this pulse here, for example, such that this pulse is overlapping with this part of the supercontinuum. When they hit the crystal, look, the crystal is put in an angle, the phase match angle, that's going to generate this kind of yellowish. So you're going to amplify the, that, the yellowish. So then I was like, I don't want to do yellowish. I want to do greenish. So then I move this guy in order to change the overlap. But then I have to change the, the crystal orientation also, see? I, I change the crystal orientation, so I amplify that wavelength, the phase match for that wavelength. And then, as it hits the crystal, boom, that one is amplified, OK? When I put the green and, and the yellow, for this type of OPA, when it's pumped at 800, I'm lying, OK? Because you're generating infrared. But I tried to put infrared here, but I couldn't see, as you guys can imagine. <laughs> so, so if you go into uh, uh, OPA, that's called optical parametric amplifier, that's what we can get, OK? Uh, for example, this is a typical OPA that we have in the lab that operates on the, on the signal from about 1,100 nanometer all the way to 1,600. And then from 1,600 all the way to 2.6 micron goes for the idler. Because every time you generate one photon, like let's say I come with 1.5 EV. I generate the one that's one EV. I have to take that half EV for something, right? Like energy has to conserve, all right? So every time I generate one photon with one EV, I have to generate one with half EV. So that's why I can go all the way, and I call that idler. Then I can go and use nonlinear optics again to take, for example, this guy that's at 1400, go to a second harmonic generation, it generate a 700 nanometer beam. So I can cover all this range over here. And then I can come again with the 700 to another second harmonic crystal and generate the fourth harmonic, which would be 350. So, but oh, I want to use uh, four micron. All right, you can get a, a different frequency generation. So you can do the, the difference frequency between, uh, typically you can do between the 800 and the signal, for example. You can get wavelengths all the way to 10 microns. So, with an OPA, you can really do a lot of things. We can cover the whole spectrum. And uh, so how does this actually look in the lab? Basically, this is a, a system bought in 2006. So I just want to show you a little bit how these things evolve over time. So I showed you the big uh, uh, dye laser, right? The dye laser had the. Uh, I swear to you, like when I, when I started my PhD, we had the argon laser with the pump. The argon laser would come from like somewhere around here to somewhere around here. But it was huge. It was like pretty much an optical table to hold that. So it was big. Now the pump is this guy over here. You see? And the whole laser, which was the rhodamine laser, for example, is only this guy over here. This is a laptop, so you have an idea of the size. All right? This, so this is the pump, this is the oscillator, this is the Q-switched pump, this is the amplifier, this huge box right here. And this is the OPA. Here is where we generate the whole colors that we can use in our experiments. Now, things got even smaller. Look at this. This is the OPA1. This is the OPA2. Look at the size of the OPA, right here. Size doesn't really change. They're about the same. OPA1, OPA2. You know what this is? Pump my plus oscillator plus amplifier. OK? See, it's about the same size of the. So look, it was like this. Now it's like this. 
So it's pretty cool, isn't it? So now I don't need to have a lab that has like 100 square meter to be able to, do, to take my data. So actually makes things more fun. Uh, so, but yeah, so far I told you a little bit how we generate those white light, uh, those femtosecond pulses and what they're good for. But uh, if we want to use to measure something, we have to make sure <laughs> this pulse is actually what we say it is. If we say it is 100 femtoseconds, we have to prove it, okay? And how we do that <coughs> if uh, electronic cannot be as fast as the optics? So we have to use optics. Optics is the fastest thing we can ever use. So I, as far as I know. So we, we, how we do that? We use nonlinear optics, basically. <coughs> we take the beam, split in two, creates two uh, arms here. We focus down to a nonlinear optical crystal again, generate second harmonic. OK? Whenever these two guys here are coming, this side and this side separately, what happens? I come in right here. I generate second harmonic there. I come right here. I generate second harmonic there. But what happens if I come together? I generate in this direction, right? Momentum conservation. OK? So I can generate second harmonic there, here, but only th when they come together in time, they're going to generate second harmonic forward, straightly forward. I put an aperture right here. I just collect this one. So I scan one to the other. And then by measuring how much I scan and uh, what was read in my PMT here, good. I can plot intensity versus wavelength uh, versus delay, and I have the pulse wave. Okay. There's a little bit of math involved, but basically it's this. And you can do other ways. For example, you can do this that I tried to do once but never worked. This by imaging, you just use like a uh, two photon fluorescence material that you focus like this, and you're going to have like this spot here, which is the size of your pulse wave. Uh, this one works pretty well. You come with the two pulses. Uh, for example, you come with a silicon detector that detects all the way down to like one micron but you have 1.5 nanometer, 1.5 micron pulses. You can come with both of them together, and when they are two together, you can generate uh, a, cur a current on this detector by two photon absorption. So again, you can measure that easily. Or you can, let's say, oh, but you know, I have a very weak pulse. I cannot really use that one to measure them. I cannot do like an autocorrelation to measure that. How can I do that? Well. You can do a cross correlation. Just take the 800, comes out of their laser, use it as one of the beams. So you're going to have a, a similar process, but instead of being second harmonic, it's going to be some frequency, but still works. Okay? So there are other methods that are much more uh, fancy, but basically, if you put this in your lab, you can actually get uh, a good measurement of your pulse wave. So I have uh, 20 more minutes to go. I try to be fast, ultra fast. When you talk about ultra fast spectroscopy, then the question is how we do that, all right? Basically, I keep talk, telling you that we can use ultra fast laser to measure ultra fast events. But uh, how we do that? That's the good question. That's the actual question. Basically, it's not only the laser. We have another good friend of ours. That's the delay stage. A lot things we want to do in the lab involves a delay stage. Because we know, we have a pulse. We can think for a moment as a pulse, as a, as a delta function. And this pulse travels with the speed of light, right? You put a mirror, like a V mirror like this. The pulse comes, hits, hits, goes back. It travels a certain distance, right? Then I take this mirror, push it forward a little bit. What happened to the distance it travels? decreases. If I put backwards a little bit, increases, right? So typically what I do, I can come with one or two or three or whatever, depends on the experiment. But I excite the sample somehow, OK? And then I come with a probing pulse, a testing pulse, in a way that I can control the delay between this testing pulse and the excitation pulse. And uh, one might think, well, but how much you can control that delay? If you think, it's not that difficult. Because let's see, for example, let's think about uh, three microns 
3 microns is 3 10 to the minus 6 divided by the speed of light. That's 3 to the 8. It's going to give you 1 to the minus 14. That's 10 femtoseconds. And uh, any delay stage you buy out there, it moves 3 microns. OK? So you have resolution. It's not a problem. All right? So you get the delay stage. You can control what the, 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 the delay between the two pulses, the one that excites and the one that probes. So basically, what limits your resolution is the pulse width, because you actually can get uh, delay stages that moves much less than that. So, so that's actually the thing that you need to, to keep in mind, that we change the sample somehow with a laser pulse, and then we come with another laser pulse and measure that change. OK? And then just by plotting the change in signal versus the, de the delay, I can have the dynamics. So typically, so another cartoon here, very well made, that will give you this idea. I come, so let's imagine, I have all the electrons here in the, on the valence band, OK? Like in the fundamental level. I come with a very strong light pulse. Shoop. I throw some electrons up there. OK? Since the electron is up there, what happens? If I come with a pulse that goes to this, like with this energy, it might go through. Because it, since it changed the distribution of electrons, it's going to change my absorption. So it changes how much I absorb. However, since I change the electron cloud, it might change other properties also, like reflectance. So if I monitor the reflection, that's good. I also can, can do that. Also, if the electrons are up there, eventually, they come down. When they come, oops, when they come down, they emit light. If I monitor the light that's emitted, I can also, can, I can also get uh, the dynamics, what's going on for the electron. Okay? So what makes me decide if I'm going to monitor the transmittance, or if I'm going to monitor what they emit, or if I'm going to monitor the reflectance? Well, it depends on the material, depends on, on the information I want to get. Okay? Sometimes the material is not transparent. So I need to do reflection. Typically, we do transmittance, which is much easier to do. At least I think so. Okay, but sometimes you're not allowed to do that, and then you have to move on. So typically, that's how it works. So you come with a pulse, goes to the delay stage, and then goes to the sample, and it comes with another pulse. Here is a little bit uh, misdrawn. I don't know why I did that, but usually we go with the pump to the delay stage. We, not, we don't like to go with the probe, but that's detailed. OK? So we come with one of them, goes to the delay stage. And then here, there is the, the pump. We detect only the probe. And the probe is going to be modified at the sample due to the presence of the pump. So typically, what we do, we create an electron hole pair. We wait until it comes down. And then we have this kind of dynamics right here. OK? Uh, we can do more, for example. Oh, what if I have more than one, life, one time involved in the process? Like typically in the lab, we, like I'm going to discuss with you tomorrow, we're really interested in looking into nanomaterials. Okay? One of the processes that we look into nanomaterials is a process called Auger recombination. I'll go back to that tomorrow with more details. But basically, what happens is that whenever it has two excitons generated in two, in, inside of one single nanomaterial, what happens is that they want to talk to each other and recombine quite quickly. And then you are only left over with one. And this one is quite slow. So if you measure the, this transient absorption, what you see is that increasing in the absorption, uh, I'm sorry, the dec decreasing in the absorption, and then it recovers a little bit here. You see quickly, this is like maybe 10th picosecond response, and then it's a plateau here. If I wait long enough, if I were able to move the delay stage by about, uh, I don't know, let's say 200 nanosecond, I would be able then to see it recovering the whole, whole way. Someone know why I cannot move my delay stage 200 nanosecond? Because then I would need a delay stage that's like 30 meters long. So, and uh, I would like, to, I would love to see my students trying line the thing to go parallel <laughs> and come back. Really, I would sit there and watch. So <laughs> he's laughing right there. <laughs> so uh, and, and the math for this is actually quite, quite simple, if you think. So if I come with the pulse, 
all right? And I excite my sample. I cause what? I cause a change in absorption. And this change in absorption, as I first excite, I call delta alpha naught, I, right after I excite. And the electrons don't want to stay up there. They want to come down. And I can associate that to a tau excitation. Remember like back on the first, second slide when I showed that you have the, the rate equation for the different process? So this is the guy. This is the process, the, the rate equation, the, that's the time involved on the decay, okay? And uh, if I come and measure the I transmitter, it's basically the I, that, the intensity that's incident, e to this power. And then this is basically a constant, and only this depends on time. So basically what I'm monitoring is this guy here. And typically, if you work the math, you're gonna see that it's a little bit more complicated, but we're talking about delta alphas that's pretty, pretty tiny. We're talking about delta alphas that are on the order of like 1%. When delta alpha is pretty tiny, I can approximate this by that, simply that. So delta T over T is basically minus delta alpha. You can work out the math, you're gonna see that I'm not lying. All right, so that's basically this. So in the lab, what we do basically, we, pay it, we take a very strong pulse, hit the sample, take a very weak pulse, that we select the wavelength where we want to get the information that we want, monitor how the transmittance of this changes with time, and bang, we got a lot of physics there, or at least we think so. Uh, so here is just one example of what happened. That's pretty interesting, I think. So you see, this is a molecule. I'm not gonna even go inside the, the idea of the molecule, but this is the molecule that absorbs exactly here at about 900 nanometer, that's the absorption peak. Here there's a vibration shoulder. And if I come with the pulse and excite it right here. So if I excite it right here, uh, and then, what? and I go and I probe it right here, what happened? When I excite it, I put the electrons, I put it first on the vibration level, but it then it's gonna come down over here. Once they come down over here, I saturate this transition. So if I saturate this transition, and I come with a photon that is right here, in this transition, it's gonna see less absorption. So if I plot minus delta alpha or delta T over T, it's gonna give me a positive signal, okay? With a lifetime, which is the lifetime of this excited state. Now, imagine that I wanna probe, instead of probing this guy, I wanna probe right here, to go from here up there. Note that I can only go from here up there only if I have electrons up here. If I don't have electrons up here, how, how can I come from here up there? I can't. So I only go if I have electrons up here, all right? So what's gonna happen to the absorption? Once I put the electrons up here, this transition is gonna increase. So if I probe there, you see a decrease in the transmittance. It means an increase in the absorption. And look at the lifetime, it's the same, same, because this absorption is saturated while I have electrons up here. And this absorption is increased while I have electrons up there. So the lifetime is the same because this is the lifetime of the electrons up here, okay? And uh, I can give you an example why it's important to do spectroscopy, okay? Because you see, this is an, uh, a study we did a few years ago for a series of molecules. We were interested in molecules for nonlinear optical processes. And you can see here the absorption of the molecule, and here is the, what we call the excited state absorption. It means that we put the electrons up here, and we measure how, long, uh, how much this electron is going to absorb light and go to a higher state. Okay? And uh, to do that, we, do, we, we use many, many different colors. We basically use a white light continuum to measure the whole spectrum. And uh, why it's important? Because if you look here, you see the peak varies from sample to sample. Imagine that I only use my 800 nanometer laser. Imagine that I don't have an OPA. Just use that 800 nanometer. What's gonna happen? If you look at 800 nanometer, you basically would have that this sample would have zero absorption, the excited state absorption. This is gonna have a little bit, this is gonna have more, and this is gonna have a little bit less. So that would be actually 
totally wrong. If I want, if you come to me and like, oh, I want to buy the molecule with the largest excitation absorption, not that I sell them, but let's say I would, then if I would have done only at 800 nanometer, I would sell to you this guy over here. Okay? Not necessarily. If you need something for other wavelengths, this might not be so good. Because you see, at 600, this doesn't absorb at all. And this has something. So it depends a lot. So it's very important that we do spectroscopy. We need to look at the whole picture, not only one wavelength. And uh, so, all right, I have five more minutes. Uh, just going to go quickly to some other techniques. Uh, like I mentioned, you can do transient absorption, oh, sorry, transient reflection of spectroscopy. So like I said, if you change the electron cloud, you're going to change the, the reflect in the in our index. And uh, you can just do the same experiment. But instead of measuring the pulse that goes through the sample, you can just put your detector right in front and measure the, the pulse that is reflected by the sample. <coughs> so you can do that, especially when the sample is not transparent and do not emit light. OK? Uh, you can do also, sometimes, if you want to get rid of, of some background noise, you can do transient grading. So you can come with two pulses, OK? So you come with two pumps instead of one pump. So you, you take your pump, you break in two. You come with these two pumps, hit the sample. OK, you're going to create a grating there. So you only have, you're going to have minimum and maximum. High intensity, low intensity, high intensity, low intensity. All right? Where you have high intensity, you change the population. Where you don't, you don't. Simple like that. So you come with your, your, with your probe beam, you're going to create a grating here. And this grating is going to disappear as of course, as the, the time goes by. And then you can measure the diffracted pulse from the grating. This is background free. So if you take some measurement that you need to get it background free, you can do this. We have like a, a few, I think uh, two years ago, we, we were trying to study graphene. And graphene was very difficult to study. And we, find, we found that doing this, we get, would get much better signal. So, that was one way around trying to do transient absorption graphene. So you got a very beautiful signal doing that. Uh, another, OK, so this is just some math for the transient grading. You're going to see that the lifetime that's involved in the process actually <coughs> need to multiply by 2. I just don't want to go to the math here, but if you see that the grading decay with an exponential of the minus 2 tau over tau excitation. OK? So if you work out the math, you're going to see that if you get a lifetime that from your fitting, that's one picosecond. It means that actual, actually, the lifetime involved in the process is actually two picoseconds. It just comes from the square over here. Uh, furthermore, sometimes we want to measure, instead of measuring the transmittance or the refraction, we want to measure emission. And that's quite important, because sometimes we have material that absorbs broad, like a broad spectrum, like nanomaterials, quantum dots. Uh, semiconductor quantum dots, they have, they have a band gap. After that band gap, they absorb everything. So if you have different population, you might get uh, contribution of all of them together, so if by transient absorption or reflect, uh, refraction. But their emission spectrum usually is much narrower. So for example, this is a material that's quite interesting. I'm going to discuss more tomorrow, but basically, it can em it's a core shell structure that can emit from the core or for the shell. However, everywhere where the shell absorbs, the core also absorbs. So if I measure transient absorption right here, I'm going to get shell and core contribution. But if I do transient photoluminescence, here I only get core contribution, and here I only get shell contribution. So I can get much better uh, information about which part is contributing to my signal. And uh, actually, is is very good also because there's no background. Because transient absorption, we're measuring delta t over t. So it's the change in the transmittance. OK, sometimes you have a change of 1% or less than that. I think the record we have done in our lab is n to minus 4. So it's very small. Here, you either have PL or you don't. You don't have half a PL. You either have PL or don't have PL. All right? So it's background free. So it makes your life much easier. All right? But there's advantages. And I think the main advantage is that samples that sometimes have very weak quantum efficiency for emission, 
and uh, some of my students can confirm that, it's freaking difficult to align. It's pretty hard to do, for example, upconverted photoluminescence. Uh, I have five more minutes. Should I continue? Uh, yeah. All right. All right. So, but sometimes you can get lucky. And uh, if the lifetime is not shorter than about 10 picoseconds, we can commercially use some, we can use like some commercially available machines that can allow us to do transient photoluminescence quite easily. Uh, one of them is a street camera. Nowadays, you can, well, the street camera is basically for the visible. Hamamatsu now sells street camera for the infrared. I never, I have never seen one working, so I, I cannot tell you how good they are. But uh, also in the infrared, you can use some superconducting nanowires, single photon counting machine that can give you up to like 50 picosecond resolution. So you can do that electronically by using some fancy, fancy physics. This guy here is pretty cool, actually, because what it does, it takes the, it takes the, the, the emission from the uh, excited sample, it takes the emission, goes to a, uh, to a target, to generate photoelectrons, and then you apply a, a, a field here, a high voltage, that makes the electrons move away. And this high voltage, actually, is, uh, is a, like a, a sine function. So <clears throat> you can take this and throw the electrons right the election is going to deviate here in time. So you can have spectral resolution right here and temporal resolution right there, just given by this fast varying uh, field. So this is like a technique. I, this is not new. This is like, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 years old, but works pretty cool. You can get, they say you can get two picosecond resolution. I never tried that. I can tell you 10 picosecond resolution. Yes, it does. So this is pretty good. Now, if you want something faster than that, if you want to measure response time that's faster than 10 picosecond, then you have to use nonlinear optics again. And one very cool way to do this is what we call upconverted photoluminescence. So what do we do? Basically, we can come with the, the laser. You excite the sample, oh, right here. And the sample, the sample is going to emit light. We take the light emitted from the sample, focus down into a crystal a nonlinear optical crystal, just like the one we use for the OPA, the same type of crystal. And then we take a very strong laser pulse. And this laser pulse goes to the crystal at the same spot. So I can take the laser pulse plus the photoluminescence and create some frequency generation. So I'm going to generate a sound frequency and detect that. But this pulse has the same intensity all the time. So the intensity of the light, the, second, the sound frequency light generated here is given by the intensity of the photoluminescence. All right? And the time resolution is given by the pulse. Because if I think about a pulse that's 100 femtoseconds and the photoluminescence that's like 20 nanoseconds, the, the, the photoluminescence is infinite compared to that pulse. So I can simply use this pulse to give me the time resolution, and the photoluminescence is going to give me the, the intensity of the light generated. So by, again, moving the delay stage, I, I change where I generate that, photon, that second harm, the sound frequency generation. And here we go. We can have temporal resolution for the PL also. And this is limited basically by the, 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 the gate pulse here. We can do other. <coughs> We can do other ways. And also here, I keep saying that it's pretty difficult to align because you have to collect the PL. It's not easy. You see, you have to collect the PL. You have to make the PL hit the crystal at the same spot as the gate. You have to come with the same time. And you have to make sure there is phase matching to generate some frequency generation. Yeah, that's difficult. It takes a long time. Uh, some other way we try to do this, not succeed yet. But one idea we have is instead of generating this, we generate uh, two, phot uh, two photon absorption in the detector. That's basically, you take out that crystal right here and take the detector and put it right there. But the detector only detects UV light, for example. It's not going to detect either the gate or the fluorescence. But we have shown in the past that we have, if we have two photons with very different energies, 
we can have enhanced the two photon absorption. So the idea would be, for example, gate it exactly at the crystal and have uh, gated two, pho uh, two photon absorption of the fluorescence into the, into the detector. That would be another way to try to do this. We have, we have tried not succeed yet, but still trying. If someone wants to try that, please join my group. Uh, so for today, that's what the take home message is. And uh, amazingly, it was exactly one hour. So to measure something that's fast, you need something really much faster than that. You cannot measure things fast with a slow clock. There's no way that. Uh, we can change the excitation of the probe wavelengths, and that's fundamental if you want to do spectroscopy. Uh, I think our main tools is the ultra-fast laser and delay stages, high-precision delay stages. In many experiments we do, we need delay stages. Uh, the most appropriate technique to use depends a lot on what you want to study. I cannot tell you here that transient absorption is better than transient photoluminescence because it depends a lot on what you want to do. It depends a lot on what material you're studying, et cetera. Uh, and then you can do like much more complex experiments. Uh, tomorrow, my plan is to show to you a little bit of what we do in terms of ultrafast spectroscopy. Today, the idea was to tell you how we do it and why we do it. And tomorrow, I'll give you some uh, examples. Right? And then I will show to you that uh, with ultrafast spectroscopy, is that one that you buy one, get two. Right? You buy one, get one free. You basically get the ultrafast system, but you get a very nice nonlinear optical spectrometer. Because uh, like I said, when you put all the electrons together, we can do nonlinear optics quite quickly or easily. So I'm going to show you also some nonlinear optical experiments that we do in the lab. And uh, just to close. Uh, my group, uh, some of them, and then that's me, that's my colleague. <laughs> yeah, not calling colleague. And uh, here's a contact you guys want to talk more about this. And, but tomorrow, you guys are going to have to deal with me for two more hours. So, All right, thank you, guys. Okay, thank you, Lazarus. So, have time for a couple questions? I was not ready. There you go. Wait for the microphone. Measure intersystem crossing with, uh, I don't know, femtosecond spectroscopy? Oh, yeah. Actually, uh, we do, and we have done already. So you, it's fairly easy. Actually, you cannot not only do that, but you also you can find where, where is your triplet state band doing that. So you can, you can see the electrons moving from the singlet to the triplet. You can see the time, lifetime involved on that. And you can see the spectral evolution also. So yeah, we have done that in the past. OK, so you can, uh, I don't know, have all the process involved to make uh, to know to get to know the whole quantum yield of a transition. Yeah, actually, uh, we can just work out some math, and uh, you come up with with that. Because what what you have to think basically is that uh, when you measure transient absorption, okay. And by the way, I didn't know there would be questions. I I I didn't prepare myself for that. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just joking. Uh, so you have like the S zero and S one, okay. So the fundamental in the first excited state. And you want to go to T1. When you go to T1, you take the electron from here and put in T1. But you, you didn't populate the S0 yet. So you still have a bleaching. OK? So you see that bleaching still. But you see the transition. So when you, when you do the transient absorption, what you see actually is something similar to this. This is, like, this is not it, but you see like Increase the transmittance, decreases, and then you have a, a plateau. Because triplet level, they live forever, right? So by studying the ratio between this part and this part, you can, I, you can, give, you can get the, the quantum efficiency for that, basically. That's like very hands-on, hands-waving explanation, but it's basically like that. OK, one more. Do you have a 
some models to determine the change in absorption with uh, reflection experiments? I personally never used the reflection experiment, to be quite honest. But uh, <laughs> you, can, you can simply think about uh, Kermit's chronic. You okay. change the absorption, you change the refraction. So you have to measure with a lot of, in a lot of wavelengths to do this, in a lot of energies? Well, you can. In principle, you can. But in principle, I, I don't think, uh, oh, I, I'm not the very appropriate to talk about uh, uh, transient reflection, because I honestly never used it, never had to model it. But uh, the lifetime, if you are interested only in the lifetime, that's right there. So you don't need to worry. But if you, need to, if you want to look into a, some spectral change, then, of course, you have to do the spectrum. Then you, have, you can just go ahead and use Kramer's chronic. Last okay, uh, can you measure charge and energy densities, have you said? What's with that? Energy and charge densities that you said that you can measure with the spectroscopy? Was that that you said before? Transfer. So can you measure this within a plasma state? I'm not sure. That's... Come on, you should ask me. Tell them to ask easy questions, not difficult questions. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, well, energy transfer, you can do, like yeah, simply. That question that has to put both to them, so they have to answer tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> I like the question for the for the quiz. But well, if you if you're just looking into like materials, and if you have materials where you have uh, you you transferring charge from a semiconductor to a graphene, for example, you can measure that. You have ways to do that. But uh, in a plasma, I have no idea. I never saw studies like that. So I might be totally wrong, but uh, I never saw. So. OK, so let's thank Lazar again.